Today on the podcast, a princess, a king, and a peasant walk into an RPG campaign. Welcome to DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Level up your RPG campaigns by filling yourself with stories and knowledge. Explore topics from archaeology to film history to writing to literature and much, much more. This is DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Matt, and I am your host. This is the podcast where we learn how to become better game masters and role players by filling ourselves with stories and knowledge. All right, guys, today's interview is awesome. We talk history, we talk RPG campaign ideas. It is phenomenal. But first, if you need some help running your games, please check out my resources that I create for Game Masters and Dungeon Masters. The main bulk of those resources are the books of random tables. You can find random tables for science fiction, cyberpunk, Wild West, modern, post-apocalyptic, all different genres at dicegeeks.com, amazon.com, or drivethroughrpg.com. So just head over to one of those sites, type in the book of random tables, and you will find my random tables. They help you cut down prep time. They help you introduce details and fill in rooms as your players discover them. Also, they are great if you are solo playing tabletop RPGs. They will keep you on your toes and surprised if you are playing these games by yourself. So enough of all that. Here's today's interview. My guest today is the award-winning game designer and writer behind the Molten Sulfur blog, Tristan Zimmerman. Tristan, welcome back to the show, man. Matt, I'm so glad to be here. It is always a delight. Yeah, it is always awesome. So what we are going to do, as regular listeners know by now, we're going to take three historical situations, topics uh, that you have written about on your blog, and we're going to break those down and see how we can use those in our role-playing games. So... Uh, Later on, we're going to talk about a teenage king. We're going to talk about a Basque peasant. But first, we're going to start off with a princess. Isn't that right? Yeah, we're going to start off uh, with uh, with the highest of the high. Uh, Mm -hmm. Her serene majesty, Princess Rudy Voravan uh, of Siam, uh, later Thailand. Um, She's just she's she's, so I I stumbled across her memoirs uh, earlier this year, and she's just such an interesting person like lying at the cross at this like really wonderful crossroads in 20, 20th century history. Um, so uh, yeah, it was, it was super great to, to, to write about her. So uh, she's born in 1911 um, and she is the, uh, the granddaughter of King Rama the fifth of Siam, what will later come to be called Thailand. Um, her father uh, is the brother of uh, King Rama V, uh, the current king of Siam, uh, when when she is uh, a small child, um, and uh, so she's she's growing up. I mean, she is a princess, right? Like straight up a princess. Uh, she's she's growing up in in palaces and in unimaginable luxury. Um, though there is this like really interesting business where like. By the standards of, you know, the, the very early 1900s, this is unimaginable luxury. But on the other hand, you read things in her memoirs and you're just like, that's, man, that is not unimaginable luxury, right? Like there is no air conditioning. There is no screens. Like, mm-hmm. um, and so, you know, just, just some fun, some fun cross section there. Anyway, uh, so um, her... Um, so so her, her father is the, 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 the brother of King Rama V. Uh, King Rama V dies, and there ascends King Rama VI. Uh, and uh, King Rama VI uh, announces publicly uh, that in the Western style, because Siam is, is in the process of, of, of Westernizing, uh, in the Western style, he would wed only a single woman. And it's, it's, it's a very big deal, because ordinarily the king has, has lots and lots of wives. Um, but he's going to marry one single woman, and he's going to be faithful to her. And... Um, it's, 
uh, and he he marries Rudy Voravan. That's that's one word, by the way, Rudy Voravan. He marries her cousin. Um, and all is sunshine and rainbows until the cousin is not able to provide him an heir. Um, and so he goes ahead and marries additional women so that he can have an heir. And his his first wife, you know, the the the, the theoretically the love of his life, the only woman he would ever wed, uh, is kind of by mutual agreement shuffled off to the side. They are now estranged. Uh, even though she is, you know, the lead queen, she lives by herself in her own palace. And Rudy Voravan is appointed to be her, like, official designated live-in friend. Um, because monarchies are wild, right? And so <laughs> she's living with her cousin. And they get along great, right? Like, they're legitimately very good friends. Rudy Voravan is a teenager. Uh, and they're living in um, what, what Rudy Voravan describes as an ex- Exquisite desolation, right? <laughs> because it's yeah. it's it's a palace, right? They've got servants and the, the incredible clothes and jewels and a garden that would blow your mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also, uh, like they don't have very many visitors because the queen is on the outs at court, and like nobody really comes by, and you know she's kind of a social pariah, and so very interesting stuff. Um, at one point, King Rama the Sixth um, starts indicating maybe he's going to marry Rudy Voravan, uh, but ultimately, ultimately drops that, stops sending those signals, um, and uh, then Rama the Sixth dies unexpectedly. Rama the Seventh ascends the throne. Uh, he starts sending these. Oh, maybe I'm going to marry young Rudy Voravan over here. Signals, and then he also pulls them back, um, and. Uh, eventually, and by eventually, I mean pretty much on her 18th birthday, uh, Rudy Voravan gets married. She gets married to a prince. They are cousins. Their fathers are half-brothers. Um, it's all very Cinderella wedding. You know, it's it's perfect. It's, you know, everybody's Disney uh, dream wedding, whatever. And then as soon as the honeymoon period wears off, they realize, oh my God, like we actually have no chemistry, right? <laughs> like we are a pair of young, dumb idiots and like young, dumb idiots the world over. It doesn't matter whether you are a, a prince or whether you are a nobody, like everybody's dumb when they're young. And it's real easy to to think that you have found your one true love. Uh, when you have not, you're actually just 18. That's what's happened is you're 18 years old. And so everyone is your one true love. So they have no chemistry. Uh, and, and they, they have a falling out. Uh, they have a son. Um, but after a few years, they get divorced. And this is a big deal because this is only the second time in the history of this dynasty, uh, the, the dynasty of the various Rama kings, as you may guess, this is only the second time in this dynasty that there has been a divorce, like that anybody has divorced. Uh, so this is a really big deal. They have to go ask permission of the king. Um, remember that this is the same king who has previously given signals that maybe I would like to marry young Rudy Voravan. So I cannot imagine that was a, an easy conversation. Um, but they get divorced and Rudy Vorvan is now persona non grata, right? She has brought shame upon the family. She has caused this massive scandal at court by, by getting divorced. Um, and, uh, and her family wants nothing to do with her, right? So she has, she has cut off from her palaces. She has cut off from her incomes. Um, and, uh, and, and like has to go get a real job. And fortunately, fortunately for her, um, her uh, her father uh, had actually prepared her pretty well for this. For, for this, he didn't realize that's what he was doing. Um, but he had he had sent her off to boarding school in England. Remember, like I said, Siam was westernizing, um, and uh, and and that got got her some some um, some useful skills, language skills, especially right, the ability to be very very fluent very facile in in English. In fact, when she was a little kid, she comes home from England for the first time um, and realizes she has forgotten Thai. 
right? She can't speak Thai anymore. That's kind of speaks to, to how to, to her fluency in English. But she also, her father involved her in, in a lot of his business dealings. Uh, he, she's a, she was a very, uh, very skilled dancer. So she had skills, thank goodness. And she kind of lands on her feet. She gets a position teaching dance at a dance academy. Um, but like, she is in dire straits and she, she, you know, kind of manages to pull it together. Um, and finally, um, you know, after working a series of jobs and trying her hand in, in business and so forth. Um, she, uh, she meets somebody and they're not, you know, young and dumb anymore. Thank goodness. <laughs> and, um, you know, she has a son by her previous marriage. The son barely sees her. Unfortunately, he lives with his dad, um, because his dad wasn't cut off from incomes and lands. That's only scandalous. If you're the wife getting divorced, I guess, um, the the new guy that 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 she falls in love with and he very much falls in love with her uh he has two or three children by a previous marriage um so like they're grown ups right and there's a serious problem though um he is he is a a a, a government employee in other words he is a commoner she is a princess legally they cannot wed um so in order to wed she has to get special permission from the king. By now, we're under King Rama the oh, Eighth, by oh the no. way. Oh yeah. no. <laughs> so at least it's not someone who had previously indicated that he might want to marry her. So that's something. <laughs> she has to go to King Rama the Eighth uh, and say, excuse me, your highness, um, could I maybe not be a princess anymore? Could you strip me of my royal title? And he he says, okay, you are no longer a princess. I, you know, it, it is done. Uh, they're able to get married, you know, cool, cool stuff. Uh, they get through World War II. World War II, you know, was a lot better in Thailand than in other parts of Southeast Asia. But World War II is pleasant in exactly zero places, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and she she gives birth to one of her children uh, in a hospital during a British bombing raid, right? Because <laughs> the Japanese have occupied Thailand and the British are bombing Bangkok in order in, in, in anticipation of taking the city. Um, she keeps working. She's, you know, kind of scrabbling her way up. And then after the war, um, her, her husband gets a posting in the United States and uh, she goes with him. She's part of the embassy scene in the United States and as part of this, um, gets involved in, in radio broadcast. And that's her foot in the door. And when they go back to the United States, uh, she continues working in radio. And she's very well suited for this because she uh, she is a, a classically trained performer, right? And, and broadcast journalism is a performance art. Um, and of course... She uh, has been been brought up around politics and newsworthy events since she was old enough to walk. So this is this is all like like breathing to her. So, you know, broadcast journalism was was a natural fit for her. And while she's working in in Thailand, um, she gets a call from Voice of America and they offer her a job in Washington, D.C. And this is the big break that she and her husband have been waiting for. Um, yeah, buddy, you're not allowed on the table. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Princess Rudy Vorvan allowed on the table. Cats, not so much. Um, <laughs> but, uh, where was I? So, uh, she brings her children with her to Washington, D.C. to start a job with Voice of America. Now, um, American listeners, uh, ironically enough, may be less likely to know what Voice of America is. Um, Voice of America is a uh, is a broadcast service operated by the United States government. It does culture, it does music, it does fair and balanced news reporting, uh, and it does these in, in English, obviously, but also in a great diversity uh, of languages. Uh, today, in the year 2022, they're broadcasting in 40 languages. Um, and the idea is and has been for as long as Voice of America has existed um, that this sort of programming, right, the sort of programming that Americans take for granted 
is a more effective propaganda tool than actual propaganda, right? Mm -hmm. That somebody behind the Iron Curtain listening to Voice of America on a shortwave broadcast or somebody uh, in in rural Syria today in the year 2022 listening to Voice of America on the internet um, might, might listen to, you know, hey, here's music and here's some cultural reporting and here's balanced news coverage, the, the, the products of the free press in my own language. And then I go ahead and I pick up a, a state-sponsored newspaper and it doesn't really look like that. Um, and that that might get people's wheels turning um, better than just putting out a bunch of broadcasts of, of John Philip Sousa music and, you know, let me tell you about America. Um, so we're still doing Voice of America. And I mentioned at the beginning of this overview, uh, American listeners uh, to this podcast may be less likely to be familiar with Voice of America uh, because VOA is legally barred from advertising itself to Americans. Uh, it does not broadcast in the United States. Um, I would not be surprised if to access it on the internet, you would have to use um, one of those services that, that changes. VPN. Your, yeah, VPN, thank you. Um, because uh, legislators uh, are justifiably really skeeved out by the idea of the United States government uh, marketing itself to American citizens. Um, so it's it's something that it's actually you are more likely to know about if you're not an American. Anyway, Rudy Voravan moves to Washington, D.C. to be a Thai broadcaster for Voice of America. And hey, uh, you want to talk about things up her, uh, right up her alley? Uh, broadcast journalism is still a performance art, so all that performance art stuff is right up her alley. All that experience with business and politics uh, remains super relevant. All of the, the music and culture reporting uh, really relies on 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 her skill set um and i just think as an npc rudy voravan by this point i will point out no longer just one word as part of of emigrating to the united states she had to give herself an american legal name now it is rudy first name voravan last name mrs rudy voravan <laughs> uh and i think she's an incredible npc right because she <laughs> has ties in so many worlds. So if you take uh, you take someone like this and you file the serial numbers off of her and then plop her into your into your existing campaign, um, she's an incredible source of plot hooks because she has ties in government. Uh, she has ties in politics. She has ties in culture. She has ties in journalism, and she has ties in all these things on two continents, right? Um, and yeah, I think she's an incredible source of information for your players. You know, Hey, we really need to learn more about this bad guy. Who can we talk to? Well, you know, I happen to know somebody. She's a great source of plot hooks. You know, she can come to your players and be like, Hey, so I came across this thing. You know, doesn't that look weird to you? Isn't that the sort of thing that you're, you're often interested in? I think she's a fabulous NPC. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're thinking like modern games or World War II era games, or what are you thinking? So uh, obviously she works incredibly well in, in 20th and 21st century games um, with the serial numbers filed off or not, uh, right? Uh, mm -hmm. For all I know, she might still be alive, though she would be very old, born in 1911. Um, but for journal for the journalism aspect, uh, most science fiction RPG settings still have a journalism uh, component to them. So science fiction, mm -hmm. this is easy plug and play. Admittedly, in a traditional fantasy setting, this is a little harder to do, right? Like you can be like, oh, troubadours and bards, like eh, it doesn't, the story, the story as, as given doesn't quite work. Um, but yeah, I think anything set in, in 20th or 21st century settings, anything in any setting where, where journalism and monarchs exist, I think this this woman is a fabulous NPC. Yeah, I I absolutely agree. I mean, because yeah, if you're doing any type of yeah, like spy intrigue investigation or or anything like that, you can really um, just use you know, like you said, like her character with you know her 
kind of the situation with the fire, you know, the serial numbers fire off right there because, uh, yeah, she just, uh, supplies a whole bunch of different information. If you're, if you're, uh, looking for, um, uh, you know, like you said, information or you're searching for different things. She could be feeding the the players, you know, the, the characters information or having them investigate things for her broadcasts or, or just all kinds of things, you know, breaking up spy rings, I would imagine, and all kinds of uh, all, all kinds of interesting stuff like that. Hard to agree. Yeah, absolutely. So th- very fascinating. And and number one, I mean, just a fascinating individual that I, I think people should read more about because I had never heard of her before. And it's just a, absolutely a fascinating story. So just in its uh in, in its own right there. Um all right. So that is kind of an NPC that can be used as a information gatherer in, in you know, or a kick off to a whole bunch of investigations for kind of modern settings or science fiction settings. Absolutely. Um, I could see upscaling it to planets, right? You could have her know a certain planet very well or two certain planets very well. That would be uh, really fantastic there. So we are going to move on now. So we are going to move on from a, I think we started with a teenage princess who who grew up, but now we're going to go to a teenage king. Isn't that right? Yeah. So um, I uh, recently read. uh, So before I was talking memoirs and uh, I've been using the word autobiography here, but memoirs totally works, too, uh, of a a king by the name of Babur. Um, And savvy listeners may recognize Babur as being the founder of the Mughal dynasty in India. Um, in the, the early 1500s. Um, but Babur is, uh, got his start not in India, but in Uzbekistan or in lands that are today Uzbekistan. Um, his, his, uh, his memoirs are incredible, right? Like, like both as, as, as an artistic feat and as a historical feat. And they're just like legitimately very interesting to read. He is remarkably candid. Um, he, he's, he's candid in ways that, that are often kind of shocking. Um, and yeah. So anyway, I, I started doing just a whole series of blog posts about really gameable moments, uh, <laughs> from Bob War's autobiography, the, the so-called Bob War Nama. Um, and Bob War, Bob War, uh, was, was born in 1483, uh, in, uh, in what is today Eastern Uzbekistan, uh, a long, long way from India. Um, and his father died when young Babur was 11 years old. Uh, and Babur, uh, his father was a king, and Babur immediately ascended to become a king. Uh, that wasn't really a blessing uh, because Central Asian geopolitics at this time was an absolute snake pit. Um, What you had was two different lineages of kings. Um, You had people who claimed descent uh, from Genghis Khan uh, via one of his his sons, a guy named Chagatai. Uh, And you had people who claimed descent from Timur or Tamerlane, Mm -hmm. um, another great Asian conqueror. and, and Babur, Babur was descended from both. He was he was descended <laughs> from one on his father's side and the other on his, his mother's side. And basically everyone of consequence who was descended from Timur or from Chagatai said, well, I'm someone of consequence and I'm of the blood of, you know, great conquerors. I will not be subservient to anyone. I am a king in my own right. So what you have is this absolute mess where Central Asia is just awash with kings. And these are are kings almost independent of kingdoms, right? Where, you know, somebody will come of age and, and, you know, seize power in this area. And, you know, then they'll take a better city and they'll move their capital to that city. And they'll be like, ah, you know, look at this kingdom and then they'll lose their entire kingdom. It'll just vanish. And they'll be like, well, I'm still a king. I'm just a king without a kingdom. And then they pop up again someplace totally different and be like, 
king with the kingdom again, baby. Uh, <laughs> so just everybody's backstabbing everybody else. It's a mess. And 11 year old Bob Orr is suddenly a king. So good luck with that, buddy. Um, but, but apparently it turns out OK, because we know his name still. <laughs> uh, well, actually, it turns out disastrously oh, no. for him. Uh, there is the, the, the line between him becoming a king in Uzbekistan and him founding the Mughal dynasty in India is, shall we say, squiggly. Um, but so shortly after he he attains the throne, um, one of his father's brothers um, uh, a guy named uh, Mahmoud. Um, Mahmoud is, of course, a king, right? Um, and he is he's the king of the lands to the south of Babur's lands. And he's looking at this 11-year-old, by now 12 or 13-year-old kid. He's like, that Babur, his lands are really nice. And they were. Babur was based out of a city called Andijan and in a place called the Fergana Valley. I mean, it's it's lovely. Um, I would really like those lands. <laughs> hey, isn't that interesting? Babur, who is very young, has an even younger brother. I bet if I put this younger brother, a fellow named Jahangir, uh, on the throne, I would be able to manipulate Jahangir. So what uh, Mahmoud does is he sends an envoy to Andijan to deliver gifts to the young king. And while he's there, the envoy kind of susses out who who in Babur's court here in Andijan is unreliable. Oh, uh, and he finds a guy uh, named uh, Hassan. And Hassan is the uh, the keeper of the gate, right? He is a, a minor aristocrat and he is in charge of the gate into and out of Andijan, right? It's his soldiers, soldiers attached to his household who operate this gate. And Hassan is, um, Hassan is, is a big talker uh, and not, not necessarily a super reliable guy. So the envoy from Mahmoud comes by Hassan and is like, Hey man, I, you know, someday maybe Mahmoud will show up outside the gates of Andijan. And if you were to just, open the gates and let his <laughs> army in like Mahmoud would, would take that as a favor, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you want to be on team Mahmoud, life could go really well for you. And then Mahmoud will put Jahangir on the throne as a puppet and everything will be peaches and cream. Um, and for many of the same reasons that Hassan was easy to turn, he made a poor double agent, right? Because he was, a big talker. Okay. He fought a lot of himself, right? He fought a, a, very much of his own importance and his own capabilities. So after about five, six months, um, he starts opening his mouth around the wrong people oh. saying, oh, one of these days, very soon here, Mahmoud's going to show up and he's going to have an army and I'm going to let him in. And then I'm going to be the big dog in here. So you better be nice to me. Uh, <laughs> so four, and he opens his mouth around the, long, the wrong people and four loyalists, loyal to Teenage Babur, uh, tell Babur that this is that this is happening. Um, now, twelve-year-olds really should not be trusted with any sort of authority. So, even though Babur was nominally king in practice, uh, he had he had a number of, of regents and advisors backing him up. The senior most am among them was his grandmother, a woman named Isan Daulat, a wonderful figure. Babur, in his memoirs cannot say enough good things about his grandmother, how smart she was, how canny she was. I was talking about the snake, the snake pit. Imagine growing to be old in this snake pit, right? You're going to pick up a thing or two along the way. Yeah. Um, so I, I saw Dalat, uh, the, the, the effectively regent um, puts out the word uh, Hassan is to be arrested. All of his soldiers are to be arrested. Uh, this this cannot be 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 countenanced. Um, but the timing is bad because purely by coincidence, when word of this reaches Babur, Hassan is outside the city. He's not in the city where he'd be easy to arrest. He's on a hawking expedition, right? He's taking his hawks out huh. to go hunt birds and rabbits and stuff. Yeah. Um, and word 
of his impending arrest reaches him before the soldiers who are going to arrest him do. So he books it. He gets out of there. He takes his retainers with him. uh, And he decides that he is going to attack a fort, a fort that is is loyal to, to Babur. Somehow the fort learns about this. This is <laughs> wild to me. There are no secrets in Andijan, right? Like I, they they have to have like pigeon post or something. For all I know, they do. The way that Babur's father died was he was playing with his racing pigeons and fell off a cliff. What? So <laughs> for all I know, all right, all Tristan, I know, this story has everything so far. You got the evil uncle trope. Uh, although this is what I've never heard of is racing pigeons and falling off a cliff while racing your pigeons. This is, this is something else. So this story has got everything so far. So yeah, maybe, maybe this fort got <laughs> notified by pigeon mail. I don't know. It's entirely <laughs> possible. These guys, they really like their pigeons. They were very good at pigeons. Anyway, they get word of this and they, uh, send out a, uh, they send out a, a raiding party, right. To go, chase after uh chase after Hassan who's of course trying to chase after the fort and they 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 bump into each other in the night and Hassan uh sends his forces out to to encircle the force from the fort and they're going to shoot arrows at the force from the fort from all around from 360 degrees around but their aim is terrible no. and they <laughs> shoot each other <laughs> And Hassan is killed <laughs> by his own people. <laughs> my goodness. Um, oh so, my you know, the story really doesn't end well for Hassan. And as a great postscript, yeah. by the way, Mahmoud, the the, the uncle, yeah. uh, dies five months later. Oh. So it wouldn't have come to, like, congratulations, oh you betrayed your king and got yourself killed. Like, even if it had worked out, it wouldn't have worked out. Oh, gosh. So this um, is definitely stranger than fiction or whatever. One of these one of these stories. Yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> I uh, I actually ran a session based on this. Uh, I, I, I want to say a month ago. It was very oh, fun. Nice. Um, but um, you like what 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 do you have here? You have the uh, the disloyal gatekeeper um, who can be anybody in a position, uh, a, a very important position in in the military or security security services. Right at your table, mm-hmm. you have. Uh, the teenage sovereign. And that I think is very important for this whole piece. I think that's, I think that's a wonderful piece of color that isn't to be overlooked because he is pliable, right? He will do what he is told by the people that he knows are looking out for him. Um, you have the wonderful character of, of the canny old grandmother Mm -hmm. who has seen much better betrayals than this one and lived (laughs) to tell about it. Um, you know, she, you're, you're not going to catch her lying down. And let me tell you, my players underestimated her and regretted it. <laughs> um, but the way I would run this, a, 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 you know, again, take the real thing and file the serial numbers off of it. But the way I would run this is um, have the PCs over here, Hassan or your Hassan equivalent, opening his big dumb mouth. Ah, right. Okay. Have them overhear him bragging about this. Uh, and then they can just be like, OK, we have this information. What do we do with it? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Do we run and tell the teenage king? If we run and tell the teenage king, like, do we have confidence that this teenager is going to be able to survive this? Because if he doesn't, then we will have just made enemies of the likely new king, right? Mm-hmm. Do we throw in our lot with the, the the keeper of the gate, right? Say, hey, couldn't help it over here. Do you need an extra pair of hands? Maybe you need somebody to handle your information security because you're really bad at it. We can help. <laughs> um, yes. Do they, the worst option, do they keep their mouths shut? Do they say, this doesn't sound like a PC problem. Like, I don't want to get involved in this. Um in which case, by the way, if, if they do that, um, then I, there's two different ways I would handle that. Way one is if the the players are just legitimately uninterested, right? Like, yeah, we saw your adventure hook. We saw this adventure hook you dropped, you, you, you gave us. We appreciate it. Thank you for doing that. You know what? It's just not our cup of tea. Do you have something else for us? That's fine, right? Then don't, don't press the issue. Do something else that your players will actually have fun in. 
Uh, on the other hand, maybe your players are scared, right? Maybe they're like, oh, this sounds very bad. You know, we don't want to <laughs> take a side because what if we take the wrong side? Oh, no. In that case, congratulations, buddies. By keeping your mouth shut, you have taken a side. And you have sided with Hassan because you could have told Babor about his treachery and you didn't. <laughs> um, except you've sided with Hassan without Hassan knowing about it. So if he does come to power, he's not going to reward you or thank you. Um, and the way you do it then is have those loyalists show up in Babur's court and be like, Hassan's going to betray you. Also, you see those adventurers over there? They totally overheard it and they didn't tell you about it, did they, your highness? <laughs> um, so yeah, you, you got this kind of th this mess with, with two sides and a couple of really fun, dynamic, memorable NPCs and a situation where the, 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 the players really have to pick a side and get involved. And, you know, if, if you tell Babur, then you got to, then he's like, oh, go arrest that Hassan guy. He's bad. And you have to go arrest him. And that's what my players did. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if, if you side with with Hassan, then he's like, ah, oh, can you sneak into the palace at night and, you know, help overthrow Babur? Um, and yeah, I just, I love that it's as soon as they hear the bragging, you are involved, right? Whether yeah. you want to be or not, this is a you problem now. And um, and and after after the session was over, all my players said, "Look, we we really liked that you did that. We really enjoyed that we sat down at the gaming table and you dropped this in our laps. And this was a hot potato we could not toss to somebody else, right? Like the adventure started from the word go, and it was really fun. Yeah." Yeah, no, it sounds it sounds great. And uh well your session sounds great, I should say. Um this situation is just crazy. And I when I saw it on your blog, I was like, oh yeah, we gotta talk about this because um it is just so crazy. Um and I think it does, like you said, it just uh forces the players to make a decision. If they don't make a decision, you know, they've already made one in a sense. And uh so I always uh I, I thought that would have been great. But it is cool to to hear that you've actually run this at your table. So uh, did uh, did Hassan still die by his own troops or how did that work out real quick? Oh, geez. Uh, what happened? <laughs> no, Hassan survived. Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, they uh, they 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 got him. And then ah. the, like the, the MacGuffin that was related to the overall campaign, like made it so that they actually it, it would not have been in their best interest for them to arrest him. But they didn't know that until they got to him because MacGuffin reasons. Um, <laughs> so then they were like, okay, uh, let's team up, buddy, even though Bob Orr thinks we're on his side. Mm -hmm. And they really bungled the 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 the, <laughs> the, the betraying Bob Orr part. And uh, th yeah, that, that. Oh, and that then was grandma the, swings in, I bet. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like they showed up at court and they're like, oh, we couldn't find him, your highness. Can we get into your treasure hoard? And the grandma was like, <laughs> Let me let me roll to see if you're lying. You are definitely lying. Do you see? Do you see my stats in social <laughs> maneuvering? Like I can tell you're lying. Guard sees these guys. <laughs> so then it turned into a prison break. Oh no! <laughs> then, then the players had to sneak out. Yeah, after all good sessions turn into a prison break after your players do something crazy. Yes. <laughs> no, that sounds awesome. And so I think that definitely does give some uh, good ideas to to the listeners. Obviously. If you're running any type of fantasy campaign, this just lifts right into a fantasy campaign, uh, D and D five E or whatever you're playing. And then I could see it working in, you know, science fiction as well. Uh, just usually like the upscale version, right? Or <laughs> not like the richer version, but the ups upscaling it, uh, would, uh, you know, could work with, uh, the size, you know, the size of empires and different things like that could work in, uh, science fiction or, or outposts or anything like that, I think. Uh, so this works in, uh, all kinds of different role playing games. So whatever, uh, or role playing game settings. So whatever people are playing, I think they can really use that and adapt that. Um, I would say uh, it works in any setting where um, people are uh, powerful. People are attached to one another, right? Okay. So whether it's, yeah. you know, like, ah, the count is loyal to the King, or in this case, like the keeper of the gate is, is loyal to or attached to the King. Um, but like, it totally work in a mafia game. Yeah. Yeah. You know, hey, here's the new Don. The new Don is 14 years old. And, uh, you know, this major, I don't know mafia words. So, like, this major <laughs> mafia figure who's supposed to be loyal to him 
It's just yeah. like, actually, I'm going to go work with this other family now, but I can't keep my mouth shut about it. Yeah. No, that would absolutely work. And then he's like, uh, he's going to open the gate to the the mansion uh, right in Manhattan or wherever they're based, right? He's going to just open them the mansion gates or something at night and let them slip in or the the gates to the warehouse where all their, I don't know, guns are kept, all the Tommy guns are kept or whatever. I don't, I don't do much mafia stuff either, but it's, it sounds fun to me already. <laughs> uh, I will say, um, I'm not going to talk about them because we're already running long. Uh, I went ahead and I included two other like court palace intrigue bits involving yeah. teenage Bob or in this blog post. Oh, so nice. like if you thought that was good, well, I got two more for you involving totally different people except for Bob or who's in all of them. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think, too, like I mentioned, science fiction, of course, like a Dune game, this just works. Oh, yeah. I mean, you don't have to change hardly anything for Dune. But even if you're in um, like a place where a monarchy or something wouldn't work, uh, it could always be, uh, you know, certain mayor of a town or a, you know, a, a petty bureaucrat kind of thing. I mean, there, there's ways to make it work, even with being kind of a young age a uh, person that would be uh, maybe it would have to be more of a frontier kind of outpost or something like that, but you could definitely make it work in science fiction as well. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. As you said, uh, time is always our enemy when we start talking history and stuff, because these are just so really cool. Um, yeah. History and role-playing games. Those are topics I could talk about quite a bit. And if you throw in Star Trek, like we usually do, I could just, <laughs> I, I, it's like days or weeks. I'll, I'll just be keep, I'll just keep talking. Uh, all right. So our final one. So we're leaving the royalty. So if people are like, oh, you're, all you're doing is talking about kings and princesses and stuff. Well, we're leaving that. We're going to peasants now. So Tristan, uh, fill us in on what we're going to talk about now. So uh, we are here in the year 1548 in southern France on the edge of the Pyrenees. Um, and we're talking about peasants and a wonderful case of, of fake identity. So... <laughs> Um, in the, the early 1500s, a Basque family um, migrates across the Pyrenees from uh, Spain into France. Uh, they, they leave the Basque portion of France and settle down in a, in a village uh, called Artiga. Um, in, in, in southern France, they, you know, they, they learn the local dialects, uh, which are not France because this is 15, uh, which are not French because this is 1548 and France is a lot more linguistically complicated than it is today. Uh, <laughs> they have kids, right? Like they, 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 they be, are full members of the, the village. And in fact, they prosper. Uh, this, this family, the Gare family, uh, the Gares, uh, they do very well for themselves. And, uh, in, they, they kind of form a, a, a financial alliance with another, peasant family in town that has has done very well for itself in this case doing well for yourself means that you uh you own a number of fields you own a number of buildings uh people work for you tending your animals and 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 working in your fields you are still working in your fields yourself though i want to be clear like these are peasants just because you own your own field doesn't mean your life isn't miserable and hard um but uh, so, so in order to consolidate this alliance between these, these, the, the, the Gares, the new guys in town and this, this other family, uh, they marry, uh, two of their children. Uh, they marry Martin Gare, uh, to a, a woman named, um, Bertrand. And these two cats and kittens are way too young, right? Um, Martin, I want to say is, uh, 14. Um, Bertrand might have been as young as nine, right? Wow. Way too young. I think maybe, maybe children in adult situations is, is the theme of this episode. That was huh. not intentional. Yeah. That's um, interesting. <laughs> but, uh, for reasons, uh, that shouldn't require too much imagination, uh, they have difficulties in the bedroom. Um, and, uh, are on a, Bertrand does not fall pregnant for a long time. And, um, there, you know, there's, there's scurrilous gossip, supposedly, uh, su supposedly, uh, Martin's genitals have been bewitched by someone. 
um, like, oh, this gets it, better it, and better. This, yeah, yeah this one gets um, better, and better. Eventually, these issues sort themselves out. Thank goodness. Um, and at, at a reasonable age, uh, where where it is not dangerous to her health, Bertrand gets pregnant. Uh, they have a son, uh, and very shortly thereafter, Martin Gare leaves the village, leaving no forwarding address. Um, this shouldn't have come as a huge surprise to, to anybody. Martin wasn't happy in the village. Um, he had grown up in a, in a culturally French environment, uh, but his family maintained like strong culturally Basque traditions, um, which, which really chafed on him because it, you know, hey, welcome to, to immigrant experiences. Um, and, um, you know, the, 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 the business with the wife that he probably didn't really want, um, you know, didn't necessarily go, go super well. And after a big fight with his dad, Martin just, just lights out. He, he disappears and no one has any idea where he has gone, leaving, uh, his wife and his, his infant son, uh, to fend for themselves. He is, he's not a nice guy, right? Uh, mm -hmm. he's, he has not done the, the, the good and responsible thing here by his family. Um, and this puts, fortunately, fortunately, people look after Bertrand. Um, they, they support her. The families are very tight. Um, and, uh, but, but Bertrand is, is in an awkward situation. Um, she cannot remarry. Um, the French church, the French Catholic church will not permit her to marry someone else unless she is able to provide proof that her husband, Martin, is dead. Uh, otherwise, that would be bigamy. Um, and th there is no like, oh, after seven years, if you haven't heard from him, you can assume like, no, has to have proof, which how on earth is anybody going to acquire proof, right? He has vanished. Yeah. Um, so and in the 1500s, I doubt they have like dental records and identify bodies they find and stuff like that. So, they do yeah. not. Not a thing. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, and even if they did, who's going to like bring word back to this tiny village exactly. on the, the foothills yep. of the Pyrenees? So um, it's 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 a it's a rough situation for Bertrand, mm -hmm. right? She mm -hmm. uh, she has this this infant son. Uh, she is not able to enjoy uh, the financial and uh, sexual benefits of having a husband. Um, but neither is she able to enjoy the social status and prestige of being a widow. She is neither, which is a, just a bad situation for her to be. And then eight years after Martin Gare disappears, he reappears. He just waltzes back into the village. Hey, everybody, I'm back. Sorry I was away for so long. Hey, wife, good to see you. And uh, he folds right back into village life. and. You know, maybe this guy, may, maybe Martin has changed a little bit in those eight years. Maybe he's a little shorter. Maybe he's a little bit broader in the shoulders. Maybe he's a little paler of skin. Maybe he doesn't know as much Basque, uh, as much Basque <laughs> language as he used to. But it's Martin. He looks like Martin. Uh, he remembers everybody, right? And and he people will be like, hey, Martin, remember when we talked about Thing X? 12 years ago and be like, yes, I do remember. And I remember you were wearing these clothes and we had this com the, the conversation in this location. Um, and he and Bertrand get along like a house on fire, right? Like he, uh, he is back. He is supportive. He is a loving uh, spouse. He is a, a partner in a very real sense, right? He is, he is sharing the, the workload. Um, he is a, for the first time, uh, he is a, a good lover, right? Like they have a, 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 a happy sex life and a productive sex life. They have another child. Um, and everything is great. And everybody's like, boy, you know, Martin's so much better. And it should not surprise you, dear listener, to learn that this Martin is an imposter. Ah. Uh, his, uh, his real name is Arno. Um, he comes from, uh, a, uh, a, a village, a few valleys away, right? Like just far enough that nobody would have ever met him. Um, and, uh, Arnaud was a layabout. He was a wastrel. He was a good for nothing. And he left home, uh, to join the French army. Uh, and he fought in the wars and came back. And while he was coming back from the wars, um, he got recognized by somebody, uh, somebody who recognized him not 
not as Arnaud, but as Martin Gare. Martin Gare, oh, I haven't seen you in forever. Where did you disappear to? And in the process learned that, hey, there's this guy, Martin Gare, who looks exactly like me and who left a widow that everybody describes as being beautiful and virtuous. Uh, and, uh, oh, and his dad is dead and left him a sizable inheritance, right? Like many fields, a lot of buildings. Um, well, I don't really have anything waiting for me at home. What if I become Martin Gare? And so he, he, he doesn't race straight away for Ortega. He... Um, he, he, he approaches the village slowly. He takes his time and he meets people along the way. Right. And in so doing saying, hello, yes, it is me, Martin Gare. We've met right stranger from a village, like five villages away from Artiga. <laughs> he's able to learn certain details about Martin Gare's life. And then he's able to use, as he gets closer, he's able to use the details that he learned, he knows to learn additional details from other people. And this, this is the most dangerous phase of the plan, right? And he is actually recognized a few times, a few times during this process, like an innkeeper will be like, I'm not convinced you're really Martin Gare, right? Like Martin Gare wouldn't be asking these questions. At some point during this process, word reaches Artiga that Martin Gare is slowly returning, but he's not home yet. And Bertrand, his his wife, Mark, Martin Gare's wife anyway, um, <laughs> leaves the village to go meet him. And we don't know what happened at this meeting, um, but it seems very likely from what we do know that Bertrand knew that this wasn't Martin. Right. Mm -hmm. Whether she did, she knew it immediately, like as soon as she saw him, whether, you know, she knew it when they went to bed together, like she figured she, she knew this wasn't her husband, but he was sure a lot better than no husband. And also he seemed like a pretty nice guy, right? Mm -hmm. Some ha some, at some point during this process, Arno became like a chill dude. Um, and they got along together really well. And so she, it seems very likely that she filled him in on everything that he would need to know in order to be Martin Gare. Mm -hmm. All the conversations that the real Martin Gare had, all the dynamics back in the village. And Arno, to his credit, had an astonishing memory. I'm going to pause here. Do you hear a rumbling noise? No. All right, cool. The, the the cat the cat is in my lap and purring like a steam engine, but he is not getting picked up, so that's fine. Uh, anyway, so Bertrand uh, Bertrand help. It seems very likely helps Arno out and helps him become Martin Gare, and they return to the village together, and everyone's just over the moon that Martin Gare is back, and they're over the moon that that Martin Gare is uh, like a better person than he was before. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, and and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll also mention, uh, Arnaud was repeatedly called out, um, like in his prior life, for having an astonishing memory, right? Arnaud had a fabulous memory and a really good head for languages. In fact, he was accused of sorcery uh, as a result yeah. of his excellent memory. That's how good it was. Wow. So he was able to hold all these details in his head and it worked. Everybody said, you know what? I'm just, I'm so glad that my cousin, my neighbor, my landlord, whatever, I'm just so glad he's back. And Bertrand was the happiest of all to have him back. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they had a daughter together and everything was fine until, dun, dun. until Arnaud gave someone a reason uh -oh. to question right? Oh, no. As long as nobody had a reason to say, as long as nobody would benefit from him not being Martin, everybody was willing to say this is Martin. But remember I mentioned that inheritance? So the original Martin had a rocky relationship with his dad, but after he left, uh, his dad composed a will where he left everything to Martin and then died. Yeah. And in Martin's absence, um, Martin's uncle, his father's brother, had taken over control of the family 
I, I feel like the word is holdings, but to me, holdings is like, you know, a fief, right? Like many villages, a whole manorial system. Like the holdings is like a few acres of farmland. Mm -hmm. Um, the property, that's the word. Um, so, so Martin's uncle kind of took possession of the, of the property and, and, you know, used it for the benefit of the family. He wasn't being a weirdo or a scumbag about it. Um, but at some point, Arnaud asked his uncle, Hey, can I see the family account books? You know, just to make sure that I'm getting everything due me in the will that my, that my dad left me. And all of a sudden, Pierre, that's the uncle's name, Pierre had something to gain if this wasn't really Martin. Because if it's not really Martin, then Pierre gets to hang on to the property. And we don't know. Like, maybe Pierre was doing something underhanded. Maybe Pierre wasn't giving Martin, in scare quotes, everything he was due in the will. But regardless, Pierre had something to gain. And so Pierre started, like, spreading the word. Like, hey, has anybody here noticed that Martin seems to have forgotten a remarkable number of common Basque phrases? Has anybody here noticed that Martin no longer displays any interest in his old hobbies? Uh, has anybody here noticed that Martin seems to be shaped just a little bit differently? Uh, I don't think that's really Martin. And some people agreed with, with Uncle Pierre and some people didn't. Um, but uh, eventually, uh, Pierre decided to take this to court. The problem was he didn't have any legal standing. Uh, in, in medieval France, as in modern America, in order to take somebody to court, you have to demonstrate that you have been wronged. And if Martin, if Arnaud is an imposter, as he in fact is, Pierre has not been wronged, right? He has not been harmed in any way. So Pierre can't bring him to court. The only person who could bring him to court is Bertrand, who could bring him to court for impersonating her husband and causing her to do an adultery or whatever. Um and so she would have standing to bring this, this court case. So Pierre goes to the court and lies oh, and says, I am the appointed agent of my niece, Bertrand. In fact, not just my niece, uh, my, uh, my, my daughter-in-law, because after, uh, after um, the, the, the father died, after Pierre's wife died, Pierre married Bertrand's mother, right? Oh, like dear. it's all very spider oh, webby. Yeah. Um, so I am here. I've been appointed by my niece slash my daughter-in-law uh, to, uh, to represent her. And I'm here on her behalf to bring a case against this imposter. Um, and the court says, wow, okay, that's really interesting. Tell us more. And things start coming out, right? Um, but it also very quickly comes out that Pierre is a liar that he does not actually have standing. And so, but the court says, you know what? This case is just so interesting and so oh, irregular God. that even though no one wronged, no one who has standing actually cares, we're going to open this case anyway. Oh, so everybody come on down. So they arrest um, Arnaud as Martin. They arrest him because they don't want him to, to run away. They think he's a flight risk. Um, but they also arrest Pierre. Because Pierre has demonstrated that he is a scoundrel and they don't trust him <laughs> not to go around like manipulating witnesses and stuff. Uh, it also comes out during this period uh, that Pierre, Pierre tried to have Martin killed. Pierre went to a relative and asked him for money so that he could hire the services of a hitman to murder son, like someone who is maybe his own nephew and at a, at a minimum, like effectively the husband of his daughter-in-law. So the court is just like, no, absolutely. We cannot let you be running around influencing oh, witnesses, Pierre. Yeah. You're going to jail too until we get this hashed out. And Bertrand, we think that you might be an accomplice. Oh, we think no. that you might not be a, 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 a victim here. We're going to throw you in jail as well until we get this whole thing sorted out. So they, they get this whole thing sorted out. And uh, this trial actually, weirdly enough, uh, doesn't matter because... Uh, they 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 find that Arnaud is not Martin. They declare it. Arnaud, uh, Arnaud appeals and an appeal is immediately granted because the case is just so weird that like a higher court needs to rule on this. 
Uh, so the, the high court in Toulouse, which has a whole bunch of esteemed scholars sitting on the bench as judges, uh, here's the case. And the case is wild, right? <laughs> um, so they uh, Pierre, Pierre has managed to turn up several people who uh, twigged Arnaud as an imposter while Arnaud was still getting his bearings, right? While he was still kind of trading up in information. So Pierre is able to bring those guys in as witnesses, but the court also has to say like, look, their their testimony is compelling, but consider the source, right? Like, are we really going to trust this witnesses procured for us by this guy, the attempted, you know, assassin hirer? Um, they uh, they bring in basically everybody in the village uh, to to testify under oath whether they think this guy really is Martin or not. Um, it's split uh, evenly between those who think that Arno is Martin and people who think that he is not. Uh, there are a number of people who refuse to testify one way or another. They will not swear whether they think he is Martin or not because they are just not confident in their answer. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, the cobbler is summoned. The cobbler says this guy has a different shoe size than the old Martin did, but this is a, a an illiterate world. He has no documentation to back this up, yeah. right? Like Arno is just able to be like, okay, uh, can you prove that I have a different shoe size, ladies? Uh, your honors of, of the bench, I cannot prove that. <laughs> um, the, uh, the the one piece of physical evidence that could conceivably be entered uh, is is a handwriting comparison. Um, but whether or no is literate or not is irrelevant because no handwriting was able to be found of the old Martin or the old Arnaud. And by the way, I, I should mention, Pierre has uncovered the actual identity of Arnaud. He, know that, he knows that this guy sitting, is his real name is Arnaud, Arnaud Dutil, uh, you know, this is his family. Uh, the court summons Arnaud's real-life brothers oh, to testify, uh, which is actually a violation of medieval French law, but the, the court says, this is so weird, we have to violate the law in order to get to the truth. Oh, nice. The brothers say, we are not getting involved, and they they run. They scarper. They they evade the bailiffs and are not able to be compelled to appear. And the the the, the weight of evidence does seem to be leaning towards Arno being an imposter. But ultimately, the head judge who one goes on to write a book about this whole case because it's so interesting from a legal perspective. <laughs> The judge says, you know what? There's two important precepts of the law we have to consider here. One, there's an old Roman uh, legal standard uh, that in cases of uncertainty, it is better to let a guilty man go free than convict an innocent man, something that is still very important here in America. Um, There is also, interestingly, a, uh, a medieval French legal precept that in cases of uncertainty, judges should err on the side of keeping families together. And whether Arnaud is an imposter or not, he is he has a family, right? Like Bertrand mm-hmm. deserves to have a spouse, particularly a good spouse who's an actual partner in the household. And they have a daughter together. That daughter deserves a father. So the judges are going to rule in favor of Arnaud. They're going to say, you know what? We're not convinced that you're an imposter. Go back to, to your land. All is forgiven. And then a one-legged man shows up at court. Oh my goodness. Declaring that he is the real Martin Gare. And as soon as this Martin is shown to the witnesses, everyone who has testified that Arnaud is the real Martin changes their story on seeing their actual brother, cousin, neighbor, whatever they say, Oh, Yep, this is the real guy. I'm sorry, I was mistaken. Even Bertrand, even Bertrand, when she sees the man that she is actually legally married to, um, bursts into tears and begs his his forgiveness. Uh, He does not offer it because he's still a dick. Um, There is still some comparison of stories. Interestingly, uh, Arnaud is actually better able to recount events that Martin should know than Martin is. Because Arnaud still has that that steel trap memory and the actual Martin doesn't. Uh, It turns out that the real Martin, um, when he left the village, uh, he went to Spain 
not France, because they're all French, he went to Spain and he joined the armies of Spain and he fought in the Spanish army against France, which is treason. Yeah. Um, in the in, During the wars, he loses his leg. Uh, he performs very well nonetheless uh, and is given a uh, is given a, an honorable retirement. Uh, he is able to retire to a um, a Spanish um, warrior order, essentially a knightly order um, as a as a non noble like supporter of the order. So, you know, they put him up. He has some place to live. He has meaningful work to do. Um, but eventually he hears through the grapevine that Martin Gare is on trial for not being <laughs> Martin Gare and, uh, and, and crosses the Pyrenees to say, no, I'm the real Martin Gare. And then he settles right back down in Artiga. He doesn't go home to, he doesn't go back to Spain. In fact, uh, the, the French court says, well, you know, what you did is treason. Like there's no arguing that, but France and Spain are at peace right now. So eh, we'll hand wave it. We'll overlook the whole thing. Um, <laughs> and he moves when the, the 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 trial ends with with Arnaud being being hanged, a gibbet is erected oh. in front of the house that he shared with Bertrand, and he is hanged there in front of the village. Oh. And then Bertrand and the real Martin, the real one legged Martin Gare, move in together and resume living as husband and wife. And at that point, they disappear from the historical record. I am very concerned about that. Uh, the, oh, if there's goodness. there's one consistent personality trait of Martin of the real Martin Gear, it's that he is uh, a dick and he is a bad person to his wife. So I am very concerned uh, that the rest of their life uh, together may have involved no shortage of spousal abuse. Um, maybe 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 hampered by his one leg, right? Like maybe that's the saving grace. Maybe he's not able to to beat Bertrand as much as he might like to because he's only tottering around on one leg. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's the story, right? Like that's the story of the trial of Martin Gare. Uh, and like, that's insanely gameable, right? Like that's, that's nuts. Uh, some ways that like immediately spring to mind for like, how do you gain this? Um, one is of course the court says, excuse me, band of adventurers. We've got a real weird legal case going on here. (laughs) Could you go scare up some evidence for us? Yeah. Um, and I've, I've I've written before. I'm not sure if I've talked on the mics about it, but I've written before about how um, legal dramas and RPGs sound like a good idea, but really they're not, right? Because who among us actually knows how to give a good courtroom speech, right? Yeah. And who do you – by God, God, do you have two such people in a party? Like one who can give it, the other person who can say, yeah, that's a, that's a three out of five. Um <laughs> So really, it sounds good. But this legal case, if what the PCs are doing is they're going out into the the into the countryside to gather evidence, that is an area where RPGs excel at. Right. Because Mm -hmm. then you're going into the countryside, you're interviewing NPCs. Maybe there's partisans for for one side or the other, you know, people who are like. I've got a lot at stake that this guy is, is the real deal. If he's turned out to not be the real deal, it, it hurts me. And other people who are like, Oh, it's really important to me that, that he be revealed to be an imposter. So, you know, these two factions now are causing trouble for the PCs uh, while they're out gathering evidence. Um, if you want to, you can throw in a little bit of magic or super science um, with, and I will point out in real history, this is Cathar country. Uh, I'm not sure if we've talked about Catharism on the mics before. Uh, 300, 350 years before all this business, uh, Catharism was a, a Christian heresy that was very, very popular in this part of France. Um, and, you know, Catharism isn't, you know, weird, nasty, evil sorcery, but like, it's really easy to file the serial numbers off of it. Um, and, I, I will note for those at home, Catharism is a dead religion, right? If you do that, you're not hurting any actual living people who are practicing this religion. There are no no actual Cathars today. Um, anyway, so so you can do like, hey, maybe this guy is an imposter, but with the help of some like flesh molding magic, and now you're running afoul of the cult that's that's out here in the boonies. Um, so you know that's one really fun way to handle it. Uh, you can also, uh, what if the PCs have a dog in this fight? Right. Like what if uh, the this will, the will that caused all this trouble in the first place 
what if the will also mentions the PCs, right? And the question of whether Arnaud is an imposter or not all of a sudden really matters to them, right? If if our, if 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 our, if Martin's dad left them a spaceship, well, they really want the spaceship. Um, does it benefit them? Like, and and, and you can play, have the, the the will structured either way, where if they they will get the spaceship if Arno is revealed to be an imposter, or you can structure it so the will so that they will get the spaceship if Arno is not an imposter. Um, <laughs> You can handle it that way. Uh, for me, the central piece in this whole story is the difficulty of determining identity in a pre-literate society, yeah. right? Yeah. How do you really prove that someone is who they say they are without a paper trail? Because mm-hmm. ultimately, you're just at the level of like, well, your honor, I feel like I knew him pretty well. And I say, that's who he says he is. Well, half of those people were wrong. Um, And in fact, there were a bunch of people who were brought in to testify that like, oh, well, you know, back in the day, Martin Garrett, he had a wart on this finger. But then other people come in and say, well, he had a wart not on that finger. It was on this other finger. He had a scar here or was it here? And once again, there was no way to determine which of the the scar or wart identifiers, which of those guys were accurate and which of those guys weren't accurate because there was no paper trail. And, and some of their identifications matched the guy in the defendant's box and some of their identifications didn't. And so in a pre-literate society, this is a really, really fun adventure. However, if you are running a game in a post-literate society, in a society where everybody can read and write and there's paper trails everywhere. Hey, guess what? Battlestar Galactica really clearly demonstrates that you can still have a lot of fun with <laughs> is this person who they say they are, right? Yeah. Like that's that's one of the central questions of the really, really good Battlestar Galactica reboot uh, from, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, is Cylons look like us? Is anybody really who they say they are? Mm-hmm. So yeah, all you have to do is inject a little bit of super science or a little bit of magic or whatever, and you're right back in the fun zone of how can we ever really be sure that someone is who they say they are? And that, again, that's where the adventure is to me. Yeah, I, I think it is really good. And I think that's a great point as well, that you know, if we're playing in a kind of a fantasy realm it is it is uh important to remember back in those times like uh that's why i think we get so many stories from that time period that are based on mistaken identity and different things like that because um yeah it was very hard right to to prove like you didn't have pictures of everybody laying around and and stuff like that so um i think that is a really good point and then yes if you take it into um the far future and you're playing a more like star trekky kind of science based game i mean somebody's got a you know D D mask or a dna kind of masking you know technology or something or you know because it's like well we have his whole genome here you know sequenced when he was a child let's check it out and it's like well actually it's really close there's a couple anomalies here but i mean that could just be from whatever you know it could be a coincidence or something and uh, so you can play it that way or like you said some kind or, of magic or even or know? even it's a perfect match is yeah. even that suspicious this guy's been in space a long time yeah. surely he should have picked up some mutations from radiation but this guy's genome is perfectly unchanged from when he was sequenced at eight years old. Is that weird? That feels weird to me, you guys. Yeah. Yeah. And he says he was this way and that way. It was like, it should be, there should be a change. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. That's a good one too, because it's like, it's like somebody took that scan when he was eight and then put it on his body somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a really good one. I like that one. So yeah, there's a, there's a ton of ways to play with this one. I know at first, some of these situations, I think at first you kind of think, Oh, how am I going to use this in games? But once you think about it for a bit, it just becomes, you know, it becomes obvious that there are a ton of different ways, a ton of different story hooks. And I'm sure listeners out there, um, who are creative game masters or role players have probably thought of a couple extra ways that they can use this in their games as well. One uh, one that I will mention, um, somebody pointed this out to me on, on Reddit, 
Um, Warhammer fantasy roleplay has an entire uh, adventure line that was kicked off by an incident like this. Um, with the incident being the party is just, you know, out doing party things and they come across a corpse with a letter on it talking about how the bearer of the letter is, is the inheritor of a great fortune. And wouldn't you know it, the corpse looks remarkably like one of the party members. There you go. Um, so, you know, we've been talking about it from the perspective of, you know, we have to figure out whether this guy really is Martin Gare. You could also take it from the perspective of maybe the party wants to be Martin Gare. <laughs> Uh, and, and I'll also point out, um, you can also do something. It, it requires a little bit of tweaking because this was thorough. But um, you can make this work in a modern setting as well without invoking too much weird science. Um, the the great majority of court cases in modern America are decided based on evidence little better than that which was entered in the Martin Gare trial. It, eyewitness testimony, people identifying other people. Um, like, oh, yeah, I recognize him. That's my cousin. Um, you know, oh, sure. I, I picked that guy out of a lineup, says the, the you know, the gas station clerk. Mm -hmm. um, like, we haven't, as, as a species, we haven't gotten any better at identifying faces than we were in 1548. Mm -hmm. um, so this, the, like, the problem has not gone away. And again, the Martin Gare case is, is remarkable in its thoroughness, right? Eight years of impersonation, um, an entire community divided, but, but don't feel that just because you're, the campaign you're running right now is set in the modern day, that this isn't, this general premise isn't usable, still totally works. And people are in prison for a lot less than this right now. Yeah. Yeah. It just becomes a problem if you say there's like a ton of pictures and stuff, but that's always, um, you know, if they were, you know, if you're saying that Martin was like, you know, 17 or something, 18 when he left town and now he's back and he's almost 30 or something like that. People change a lot <laughs> right between those two, those two, you know, those ages. And so I, I think it could definitely work as well. And you're right uh, that it's just like, well, you know, I thought he was a little taller, but, you know, who knows? Right. I mean, that was a long time ago mm -hmm. and I wasn't really, you know, I wasn't asking him if he was 5'11", you know, all the time. <laughs> I was just, you know, we were just talking. We were just friends or whatever. Um, yeah, so no, I think that's great. I think uh, this one could be used in in a lot of different ways, and uh, I think it's it's just one of these situations where, uh, like we're always talking about with these situations, this is something that, um, you know, taking a situation like this and using dropping it into your games is, I guarantee you, you know, very few role players will have encountered this. I guess unless they're playing that uh, 40k game. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If maybe if if one of your players is just real into Warhammer fantasy, oh, maybe Warhammer don't do fantasy, this. But right. like yeah. otherwise, go to town, my dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well, Tristan, these were awesome. Again, obviously, we have gone over again, which is just normal by now. I mean, I don't know why we say over. It's just we should figure on these episodes being an hour and fifteen to twenty minutes anyway. I guess. Yeah, um, we, we did. We didn't. I think we're at an hour and fifteen exact right now. So hooray, we we hit the mark exactly. There there you go. Yeah, there you go. All right. Well, Tristan, just remind everybody, where can they find you, your role-playing games, and more articles like this? So uh, you can find more like this at ModenSulfur.com. Uh, I write the Molten Sulfur blog every Tuesday. Uh, I put out content pulled from real history or real folklore, uh, stuff that is fun and cool and worth learning about in its own right. And then I show you how to file the serial numbers off of it and drop it into the campaign that you're already running. Uh, I also am uh, the author of the tabletop role-playing game Shanty Hunters, uh, winner of a Judge's Spotlight Emmy Award um, that you uh, would encourage you to pick up. It's very cool. It's about uh, collecting magical sea shanties in the year 1880. Uh, and I'm hard at work on the sequel, Ballad Hunters, uh, about collecting uh, magical uh, folk ballads in England and Scotland in the year 1813. So stay tuned for more on that.
All right. And as always, I will drop some links in the show notes. So anyone who is listening right now, you can head over to DiceGeeks.com, check out the show notes for this episode and find links to the Molten Sulfur blog and to Shanty Hunters. Uh, Tristan, it was just a pleasure to have you on again. Uh, Thank you so much. Always a joy. All right. There you have it, guys. I really hope you enjoyed my conversation with Tristan today. It is always always a ton of fun when he comes on the show so many interesting historical topics situations that we can just put right into our games it is awesome like i said in the show if you want to learn more about tristan and his rpgs and his historical articles head over to the show notes at dicegeeks.com you will find links to his blog and to his role-playing games please do so now if you want some free stuff Head over to DiceGeeks.com slash free. You'll get a whole bunch of free stuff. Trust me, you'll like it. Also, if you want to support the show financially, you can do so at Patreon.com slash DiceGeeks. Also, liking, rating, reviewing, subscribing, all that stuff really helps the show out. I would greatly appreciate all of that. Thank you so much for listening, and until next Wednesday, keep gaming!